director Nancy Mayer started off Broadway, then moved to LA as a senior VP of feature film casting for Universal Studios. There she oversaw casting for Steven Spielberg on Casper and the Flintstones, and Sam Raimi's Darkman, Spike Lee, Ron Howard, Oliver Stone, John Hughes, among many others. After 14 years at Universal, she opened her own casting company to cast movies such as Long List, Act of Valor, Ouija, Road Trip, The Whole Nine Yards, The Grudge, Exorcism of Emily Rose, When a Stranger Calls, Kit Kittredge, American Girl, Nims Island, as well as Wes Craven's Scream 4, Kidnap, starring Halle Berry. The range of tone is incredible. <laughs> In TV, Nancy cast the MTV series Eye Candy, starring Victoria Justice, the Kevin Williamson pilot Secret Circle for the CW, the Messengers for CBS CW. She is about to begin casting another CBS CW series called Valor. So, heavy hitter, and she's here to talk to you. Our host tonight, our moderator, is Tova Leiter. She's a producer with credits including Glory with Denzel Washington, you might have heard of him. Oliver Stone's Nixon, Evita with Antonio Banderas and Madonna, and Varsity Blues. And she puts together the amazing guest speakers. Here we go, Nancy and Tova. about you but I just got that message loud and clear of this movie <laughs> yeah. yeah it's powerful you just saw the film right did you like it yeah. it's very moving isn't it it's yeah. very deep beautiful message yeah. yeah how did you get involved with the movie who from the group of people that did ask you to come well there's so many producers these days that yeah. you never know who, who yeah and what. it's true it, it came to me um, I was very fortunate because it had a first incarnation with a producer named John Shastak yes. uh, before it was with Awesomeness, and which was the company that finally produced it. But it was at another company first, and there were different casting directors on board. So uh, I didn't really know anything about it, uh, but I had a relationship with an executive at Awesomeness because I'd done four or five projects at Blumhouse, and that executive was at Blumhouse, then he moved to Awesomeness. So I had a meeting with him and he said, we're about to take on a new project and we want to send you a bunch, but this is the first one we want to send you. And it was a little awkward because that original producer had other casting directors on it and I had to sort of like take their baby and start from scratch and work with my team of producers. And uh, so that was a little bit of a bumpy start, but then once uh, everyone realized I was on board, I got to really dive in. And, and I think with Awesomeness and with the director, I felt so fortunate to be working with them. And, and with John, we sort of gelled, and then it became a really cohesive team. And everyone had a really similar vision of the kind of actors, the caliber of actors that we wanted, and the depth that we needed, and also the balance of lightness and depth because it's got a lot of serious themes but if you go with actors that are just nothing but serious it it misses that nice balance of tone where there's fun in the midst of tragedy right so yeah and um so nobody was attached no, no actors were attached no. so that's really you picked all those people yeah it's funny because my very first movie way back um, was with uh, Zoe Deutsch's mom, Leah Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> and who knew, like years later, that she would be in this film or that I would get to cast her daughter. Um, I mean, this was, you know, way back. But um, it's clearly a very talented family. And strangely, her dad is um, Howie Deutsch, and I had cast, he's a director, and I had cast two films for him years ago. So it's sort of like the whole it's family. It's all in the came family. Around. Yeah. They're it's a very all in the family. talented family. She's she's grown up with a lot of talent around her. So um, how did you start in the business? Um, I started as an actor, uh, in <laughs> most casting directors usually do. Uh, I started in school plays and 
I went to NYU and studied with Lee Strasberg, and I was convinced that was my calling. And <laughs> and uh, then, but I, Lee wasn't convinced. No, no exactly. <laughs> but then I, after school, I did an internship at Manhattan Theater Club, which was a really cool off Broadway theater, and. Um, in my first 48 hours, I thought, I'm going to go in stealth and I'm going to do casting and I'm going to learn what, what the actors always want to know, which is, you know, what they really did right or did wrong in the room because yes. there's no time after the audition to tell everyone or give everyone a report card of why they didn't get the part. And if everyone knew why, they could really learn a lot about how to hone their auditioning skills. So I thought, I'm going to learn by doing this casting internship. And literally within the first 24 hours of casting, I thought, I think this is this is my destiny. I really um, prefer this side of the table. And I, th I saw so many wonderful actors my first day as an intern, I thought I'd rather help these actors than compete with them. Just, it just somehow became clear, so. Wow. Yeah. And so how do you make the leap for casting for Broadway and ending up in Los Angeles as head of Universal Feature Casting? That's well, quite a leap. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was wild. I had a friend who from uh, NYU who came out to LA and was working at Universal as an intern, and his job was to help uh, a a writer, Cameron Crowe at the time, who hadn't been directing yet, um, on his follow-up to Fast Times at Ridgemont High, it was called The Wildlife, and a producer named Art Linson was directing, and a casting director named Don Phillips, who had cast Fast Times, was casting. And my friend's job was to find a casting assistant in New York for a couple of weeks. And so they, uh, they met with me, my friend introduced me to them. They hired me for two weeks, and then uh, the casting director said, you know, I could use a little help out in LA can I send you a plane ticket? I'll get you a car, gas money, salary, just for a couple of weeks in LA. And I had a cousin who lived on Fifth Street in Santa Monica, so I thought, this is perfect. I have a place. Yes. I'll come out. It'll be two weeks. And that somehow turned into 14 years at Universal. <laughs> um, and within, right after that project, which was called The Wildlife, um, it was, I was working for the head of casting at the time. His name was Michael Chinich, and he was doing in-house um, Mask with Peter Bogdanovich, which was a movie that starred Cher right. um, and Eric Stoltz, and uh, John Landis was also doing a movie with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer and Jeff Goldblum, and they needed extra help, so I, I helped on that. And then bit by bit, within, after my first year, all the people I was working for left Universal, and the head of production decided I should just replace them and become the head of casting at the studio, and I was 25 at the time. So it was a bit of a crazy time for me. I was so appreciative of the opportunity, but I really thought for years um, that someone would tap me on the shoulder and say, this, this might be a bit, a bit premature for us <laughs> to give you this position, but I just thought I'll, I'll learn as I go, and, and it was a wonderful education to be at a studio and learn totally. from the inside. You mentioned that you cast for Blumhouse, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you guys know, but the movies that they're doing are successful. The last one was Get Out. Get Out and Split. All the paranormal activities and, you know, they right. tend to make movies for like two to three million dollars. Oh, Insidious and The Purge. Yes. Uh, they make these movies very micro budget, and they make them for three, and they make like three hundred million or two hundred right. million. Or right, crazy. And everybody's yeah, rich from this little two movie. Yeah. So when you cast for that, um, obviously you can cast for stars because the budget is not there. Mm -hmm. And is there something? Does he have a certain kind of an agenda or vision? that he likes to replicate in each one of his movies? In other words, is there a formula for the success of that? And is casting part of that formula? I think it's a combination depending on the project. Like the, out of the batch of movies that I did for him, the two most successful ones were The Boy Next Door with Jennifer Lopez and Ouija. 
and uh, the boy next door, Jennifer Lopez, was attached. And however, we didn't have the title character, which was the boy next door. So we had auditions with Jennifer at her house. Um, these actors got to come and make out with her basically during the auditions. <laughs> it was really kind of a wild experience for them. They were all just like deer in headlights. <laughs> they didn't realize this was, you know, I mean, not officially make out, but you know, there was some kissing and they, they needed to kind of step up and, and be <laughs> relaxed with her enough to do that. Or, you know, you wouldn't want to hire them and find out they were going to freak out on the set. So you, you literally had to go through that part of the audition process. So it was like little kiss, but, um, that was for the callback, actually, not the not the first <laughs> round, but uh, that was the bonus part of the callback. Um, but you know that one, they already knew they had the star power of Jennifer, so they could go with an unknown, and it needed to be, you know, it, it well, it needed to be someone sexy but innocent because he eventually is the bad guy, and you need him to feel not like an obvious bad guy till. Right. later in the in the movie. So at the beginning, you need to feel like he's innocent and sweet and charming, and then things go horribly wrong. And, you know, if you sense that he's a bad guy at the beginning, you think there's something wrong with her, that she's not smart enough to have picked up on it, you know, right. on the, that vibe. So he needs to have a huge range as an actor of sweet and innocent and charming, and then psycho, crazy, nut job. So um, dangerous, nutty guy. Um, so that one, it had Jennifer. And then with Ouija, Ouija it, the, the Ouija board itself and the game was the IP. So they already had the name selling the project, and they could go with all unknowns. So that one had uh, people who were like Douglas Smith, who was on Big Love, and Bianca Santos, who was on The Fosters. So like kids who are known to a little degree but not giant names and the leading girl they did a lot of testing for um, wound up Olivia Cook. it was her first American film she was then after that in Me Earl and the Dying Girl if you saw that which is a beautiful film and um, and now she stars just a few years later she's starring in Spielberg's upcoming film Ready Player One so uh, that was cool for me to be able to give someone that first opportunity and see them, you know, really kind of catch fire in the industry. But those two movies were different casting strategies, and one was more star-driven, and the other was the opportunity to discover and assemble like a nice ensemble cast of, of up-and-coming actors. So yeah, I think, I think he's open to a variety, which is nice. It's good. So you worked with a lot of directors in a lot of genres. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference for you as a casting director um, when you cast for comedy as opposed to drama mm -hmm. or action? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just funny that you asked me that because it's funny, when I left Universal, the first two movies I did were The Whole Nine Yards and Road Trip. And I used to go into, uh, you know, when I was at Universal, I had a steady job for 14 years, so I didn't go on interviews. Then I suddenly had to go and kind of sell myself and meet people and talk about what I did. And I would sort of apologize for having so much comedy on my resume. Then I did The Grudge and Exorcism of Emily Rose, and suddenly, like, the casting floodgates opened for genre pictures. Right. So I would go in and apologize for that in the sense <laughs> that, you know, I was like, I really am funny. I'm very funny. And, you know, I'd have to explain that. Um, and for a while there, I felt like sort of casting Queen of the Damned, where I was, you know, Last House on the Left and Scream 4, and some was comedy horror, but some was, you know, horror horror. And, um, you know, I sort of drew the line at a certain level of, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm a squeamish person, so let's put it that way. I like more sort of popcorn horror, not like graphic horror, yes. violent horror. That's not my thing. Uh, I've never seen a Saw film. I don't think I could. Um, but the first one was good. I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, I'm too squeamish. But um, I saw the trailer, and it looked it looked interesting. But yeah, so I mean, I think it's different in the sense that um, there's a comic timing. People who have that are born with it. I think you can develop it, but it's kind of what you're born with. <laughs> and um, 
with the dramatic casting, I mean, people really have to go for it and be very uninhibited and especially if they're being possessed by the devil or, you know, <laughs> dying some horrible death with, at the hands of some horrible monster in the audition room. It's very, you know, actors really have to commit to, to uh, sort of different depths. Um, so it's very different. Yeah. It's interesting in comedy, I would like, um, I would think that, I would go more for the obvious comedy and the mm -hmm. directors always said, okay, don't try so hard, just play it straight. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah. And the other thing that, um, when I worked on 21 and Over recently, I, I, it was with the guys that did The Hangover, and I think more so in comedy, there is that freedom to improvise. Right. I think comedy writers like that and kind of encourage that yes. freedom more so than dramatic auditions. And a lot of people came into that audition saying, you know, they loved The Hangover, they had these two writer directors on a pedestal, and the guys were like, hey, welcome, thanks for coming, listen, we wrote this script, we are so bored with our own words, we really just want you to <laughs> improvise the entire audition, go crazy, launch into a scene from Braveheart, we don't care, just go nuts. And so, you know, there was that that lighter lightness of yeah. that, you know, if actors came in, some actors heard that and were like excited and others looked like deer in headlights, like, oh my God, we've memorized everything. I studied every so much yeah, on like, this and now I yeah, have to do something else. Exactly. Do you think that every actor should maybe do some kind of, um, you know, citizen, what is it called, brigade or, you know? some kind of a comedy improv oh uh, oh yeah um ucb yeah uh yeah i think i think generally it's nice just to not for any of us whatever profession to not take ourselves too seriously so certainly <laughs> whatever you're doing behind the camera or in front of the camera to have that bring that lightness um can only you know nourish your soul and in terms of the ability to improvise, it's so key. It's really key. I think just the best actors have that freedom. And a lot of times when you see the making of a film and you hear the actors talking and the directors talking, they'll say, remember that moment where the actor did this? It wasn't in the script. They found this just magic moment that just came from the air. and. Uh, that's what's really special. I was when it. I started to do that. There was the uh, producer of uh, Taxi Driver, mm -hmm. and he says that that day he wasn't on the set, <coughs> and that he came in the evening and he was watching Rushes of the Day, and suddenly he see De Niro saying, "Are you talking to me? Are you talking <laughs> to me?" And he turns to Marty Scorsese and he says to him, "Where did that come from? It wasn't on the script." Mm -hmm. What did you say to De Niro? And Scorsese said, I told him, do something. <laughs> yeah. And De Niro came up with this whole, are you talking to me? Which is yeah. now, of course, the most iconic. Classic. Classic thing. Okay, I'm opening up to you guys to go and ask questions because this is really for you. So whoever wants to ask a question, the microphone is there. Hi. Um, Hi. My name is Sonali. Thank you so much for being here. We already learned so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, my question for you was, um, I do a lot of singing. So do you think musicals are like more, people are going more into them, casting more for those type of movies since La La Land? Um, good question. Um, I think they've always been popular. They sort of go in cycles, like Chicago was an amazing musical. and There's just been so many amazing music, movie musicals. I, my background was music and singing, and I, again, I think you can't lose by keeping that up and keeping that up as a discipline, and you just never know when you're going to need it. Um, I mean, I think it's good to have both, and keep studying for more dramatic non-singing roles, but you just never know. I think it's a great skill to have. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know why you do it. Why, why are you still so passionate about it? Oh, good question. Nice. <laughs> um, <coughs> it's so creative. Um, it's like, why do you cook a good stew like you just get pleasure from it and 
Like tomorrow I have a table read of um, a project where I've assembled the cast uh, around Gabrielle Union. She's, she's starring in a project for Universal and Will Packer's company that um, did Straight Outta Compton and they're just a wonderful company. And, and I feel, my husband said, uh, what's happening tomorrow? I said, I'm going to the table read. He said, well, isn't your job done? Why do you need to do that? I said, what do you mean? Why do I need to do that? that is the best part. That is right, the most yeah. exciting moment to, to see everyone assembled and see everyone in their sort of rightful place. You've, you've sort of cherry picked these cool actors and to see them all together and hear the whole entire script. I mean, it's just so pleasurable. Um, I think as much for me as it's exciting to like make a list that has Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise or Kate Blanchett on it, it's very exciting for me to have opportunities where I can help give someone their first role. Um, and it's thrilling to see their careers being launched and to be able to feel that I have a part in that. Um, it's a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. Sorry for my bad English. No worries. <laughs> What's the thing that you always look for in every actor that you cast in your films? Um, I would say reality. I know this is weird because acting, you feel like, well, you know, there's your real life. And then when you're acting, you're acting. You're not being real. You're acting. But to me, the best quality in an actor is when I literally can't even tell that they've started the scene because <laughs> they're so natural and they bring so much of themselves to it that it feels seamless between their, it's like, it's like breathing. Like it's, it, there's no difference between real life and acting. So I look for that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey. Hey. So I really love books and stuff. Oh God. <laughs> and um, so when it comes to adaptations, mm -hmm. um, how do you find a person who would um, really embody the character? And like, have you read the book? Well, that's interesting because so. nowadays there's a lot of online opinions when you have something that's based on a, a prior novel or book. Um, it seems that everybody has these opinions of who should be cast as opposed to an original screenplay. No one has, you know, brings that, you know, past history to it. So I tend to start not if unless I have read the book by coincidence. Mm. Like I'm about to work on something where I haven't read the novel and I prefer not to because I I feel like the script sometimes has its own, you know, vibe and I want to be true to that um, and not have a preconception based on, you know, how I felt about a novel. So, um, although I appreciate novels, but, or I appreciate books, and I think these days, I met with a producer recently who said, I only produce movies that are based on popular books because there's already a built-in audience. There's already a built-in fan base. So I really respect that, but from a casting perspective, I like to kind of keep a clean slate for myself and just dive into the script, so. Okay. <laughs> Hey. Hey. Do you have any recommendations for like actors who've done uh, who've done a lot of theater work but mm. no TV experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think I, you started to ask me that before, and I'm not sure if I answered it. But in terms of stage versus you know, in theater, especially depending you know what your experience has been, oftentimes there's a tendency to make things bigger and broader. Um, because you're oftentimes, depending the size of the theater, um, you're playing to a back row that's really far away and you have to be a certain broadness to have that emotion read. Uh, and the camera for, for the big screen or the small screen is just so sensitive and picks up the, the slightest little nuance. So I think there are, um, I, I don't know which ones to recommend, but there are on-camera classes where you can literally see, oh, God, that facial gesture that I thought was so subtle is enormous and I and you can kind of develop a sensitivity to how your expressions read by watching yourself um, so I would recommend that 
especially to make that transition. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, I just really want to know, like, what does it feel to be in a film industry? And then I'm kind of really interested to be here. And then, like, where should I start? Where should I start to be in a film industry? Okay. And you're an actor? Or um, no, I'm in a filmmaking camp. So basically, filmmaking. I will be a director. Yeah. Oh, okay, director. Um, well, I, it, how does it feel to be in the, it, I mean, it feels great, <laughs> so, like, especially when I get invited to speak in front of all of you, it feels really lovely. Um, you know, we just do our job, and then when you get to talk about it, you remember, just to sort of remind myself of all the things I love about it, but, um, but I was just, and actually an answer to you and the last gentleman who asked the question, um, a thing that I'm really um, excited about these days is that uh, you don't, there's no way that you can be undiscovered technically because there's a thing called YouTube or there's a way, I mean, you, you can't say, oh, I can't show off my work as a director, as a writer, as a, there's so, you know, as an actor because you can post your own work for the world to see. So you can't tell yourself, oh, I, I have this excuse of I can't be discovered. You can put yourself out there. So I am a huge believer at the beginning of anyone's career in um, self-tapes and whether that's actors who get together with their friends and either get either prior written material or they write for themselves or their friends write for them and they tape their own monologues or scenes or work and, you know, at at any ask for any aspect of the industry you can basically have a, a sort of a diy project and do it yourself and create something amazing um, that could be discovered or at least can be a calling card for you you don't have to wait ever for permission to be creative and that's a wonderful i think aspect of the industry right now and especially if you have friends that are um, you know, in it with you and all these different disciplines, you can really assemble something that looks a lot like on a reel as an actor if you want to do your own scenes. A lot of times I've seen reels and I think, oh, look, this person did this interesting independent film and that interesting independent film. And it turns out it's all self tapes that their friends have helped put together. So that's a wonderful way to start, really. Instead of, you don't have to depend on anyone else. You can just start yourself. And by the way, you never know who's watching it on YouTube. That's right. Mm -hmm. It could be a big director and they have their kids watching. And, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're laughing or whatever it is, and they show their father, you know. Yeah. I know half the people who worked with Spielberg, and whether it's a composer or it's cinematographer, they all said that he was like, you know, two o'clock at night, he couldn't sleep, so he was watching a movie and suddenly he said, that's an interesting uh, yeah. cinematographer, that is a good composer, and the yeah. next day, you know, he'll ask to meet with those people. Yeah. So, what she's saying is, you know, you can be seen, and mm -hmm. you never know who's going to see it out there. Yeah. Get stuff done. Yeah. I mean, Jonah Hill was here and he just said, Always do something. Yeah. Always create something. Yeah. Well, and also, because especially, well, any of the disciplines, it's like a muscle, and you can't wait. For you. It's like you have to go to the gym. You have to work out. So, you know, you don't wait to be invited to the gym. If you want to work out, you go to the gym. <laughs> so, I mean, you're here, and you're here studying. So, I mean, to be able to constantly flex those muscles keeps you in shape, you know, creatively as opposed to thinking, oh, well, when I get hired, then I'll get in shape. No, it's right. like you have to get in shape first, so. Oh, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Okay. So I'm an actor at this camp right now, and I plan on being an actor when I grow up. And um, after talking to my teacher at the camp and he told me that uh, the industry has been getting really competitive in the last 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you have any quick advice for someone who is at, as an upcoming artist in terms of like being resilient. Mm -hmm. More competitive in what way? Because of more channels or more? I think there's more opportunity than yeah, ever. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. And especially for diverse uh, yeah. talent. Mm -hmm. More yeah. and more. Definitely. Um, 
I think, well, resiliency is sort of an inner thing. I think you have to, it's funny because you're in the business of emotions as an actor, so you want to be vulnerable, you want to be sensitive, you want to have your emotions just right there to call on. And at the same time, you need to have a thick skin and not um, get hurt by rejection because the odds are you'll get rejected more than you will get hired. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of it. So once you realize that's just the odds and that's just part of it, you, the resiliency comes from not being hurt um, and not wanting to quit because you just never know if you stick to it what will happen. Um, but it's easy when you're this emotional being and you know your emotions are so part of your everyday business to not feel hurt when you don't get something. I mean, I had that steady job for 14 years. Then when, <laughs> then when I left that, I had to go in and interview and basically sort of audition for jobs. Like I'd see other casting directors in the waiting room and I'd think, oh, damn it, she cast Twilight. I'm not getting this gig. I'm like, oh, they're better. <laughs> you know, oh, I saw what they cast. They're awesome. You know, I'm not getting it. So, um, you know, I mean, you go through the same sort of interview process on all levels. So to cinematographers, so to production designers, everyone does um, when you're freelancing. And I think resiliency, which is the word you used, comes from, um, you know, not de being discouraged by the rejection, being motivated by it to just continue and keep going. Right, Remember what you. Carnegie Mellon yeah. once said? He said, as, as a salesman, mm -hmm. you probably get rejected 25 times until you make the sale. Yeah. So every time you get rejected, you should be really happy because you're getting closer to exactly. that 25 when yeah. you're going to make the sale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hi. 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 Um, so in your opinion, what's the best way for an actor to attack a monologue or a script when they're auditioning? Okay, good question. Attack a monologue or a script. Well, um, it's funny because we don't see monologues that often anymore. Usually... I'd say a lot of times we have, well, that's a good question. Well, usually when, when I have auditions, I have people do scenes and there's readers um, that read with the actors. Um, and I think one of the best ways is to know your lines as best as possible, um, but not feel that need to be off book. Sometimes people feel this obsession to have it memorized and they get so caught up in that that they keep forgetting the lines. And I keep saying, it's really okay to hold your script. No one is expecting it to be completely memorized. So that's one way. And then um, I think this is my tip, which is, um, it's kind of goes back to what I was saying about Lucas and Moore and how they said improvise. Um, you, when you come in and read, uh, you are an actor who has prepared and rehearsed and rehearsed and there's a tendency, especially when you're newer, to be over rehearsed. And to me, everyone gets so upset if they mess up a line or if they forget or they kind of stumble. And actually those same directors said, I love it when actors fall, tri kind of trip over their tongue because it's real. I think people tend to seem over rehearsed and and the actor is rehearsed, but the character should be saying those lines and feeling those emotions as if they've never said them before. And to me, the key is to create a way of speaking. Like I don't know what I'm going to say next, so I don't speak in a rehearsed pattern. I don't I don't know what's going to literally come out of my mouth next. And I want that quality in every character that I see in the audition room. So you have to kind of find a way to fight that tendency to be over rehearsed. And a lot of times that's to add in, I know this may not be every director's dream, but to me it's to, to sometimes you, you say, um, or you stop mid-sentence, or you think about a word before you say it. I want to feel like, the thoughts are coming to you instead of you've rehearsed it a million times. And as an actor, you should take pride in feeling well rehearsed, but as the character, it should be so fresh and so new and so spontaneous that I feel like you've never thought those thoughts before. And that's a technique that's worth sort of exploring and playing with. Okay, so. thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is it possible uh, for people with international accent to find to be casted uh, in a good project here? Um, I'm thinking of Wonder Woman because Gal Gadot. Have you seen Wonder Woman? Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't that she's Gal Gadot? Got a, Gal Gadot. Gadot. She's got an accent, and it didn't stop her. Um, so I think there's no reason not to. I mean, I think your um, opportunities will increase if you can kind of help uh, minimize your accent, but that's something over time. It's not a, it's not an absolute requirement because there'll always be opportunities um, for characters from all different all over the world, especially now the the world is so getting so much smaller that I mean if there's a project about a farm town in Iowa and a family that grew up in Iowa, you probably wouldn't get it, but there's lots of a million other opportunities, you know, for uh, projects where an accent is totally perfect, you know. Yeah. It's still good to... Um, yeah, to work on it. To work on your kind accent of smooth so it you out. have more opportunity. Yeah. More opportunities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good night, how you doing? Hi, good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, Ryan Goldsmith. Um, question that I had was, uh, so as a unknown or uh, unknown talent, like getting in front of casting directors, like how would an unknown talent like secure, like getting in front of casting directors to actually like get that opportunity to be like a first time talent in a major production? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, there's a couple of ways. Certainly, it helps to have an agent. Um, so that's a whole other process <laughs> to find an agent. You actually kind of want to get in front of an agent before you get in front of a casting director because we spend our days um, trusting the opinion of agents who have gathered new clients from all over. And they're always looking for new talent to represent. So in a way, I think that's a first step. Um, then it's easier to get seen by the casting director through an agent. But if you don't, um, I would say kind of what I mentioned before to, to create some work uh, because sometimes people send their headshot and I think, oh, they look like a nice person and I have no idea if, how their acting is. So um, I think the way is to have some work that you could send on a link. Um, and to make it easy, because you never know. In the old days, it used to be postcards. Actors would send postcards with their head shot and their picture and their phone number. And now everything's online and email. So if you have a link um, that has like even a monologue or a scene or something that's just three minutes of you being awesome and being an amazing actor, you never know how it can get to a casting director. And once it does, then it's a great calling card. So. I think start with that little piece of footage and make that a project and then find ways to get it to either an agent or a casting director. And I mean, honestly, my email's online. <laughs> it's like, it's like you, you, there's ways if you really are, you know, sort of sleuth about it and, uh, and you want to. Just the way that postcard used to come into our office and you never know who you picked up and you were like, oh, I'm looking for somebody who just has this look. You know, if you send a link with a great piece of work or two, three minute scene or monologue, who knows? Who knows what Better could happen? Better be a good one, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you never know. Yeah, it has to be really make it your best. Uh -huh. But that's the greatest thing about doing your own projects is you can have your friends look at it and give you feedback and you can do as many takes as you want. You have all right. the control over the quality of it in the world, you know. So this is a great time and opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Marie Singer. I'm an actress who just graduated from the associate program here. Cool. Uh, so again, thank you so much for coming. And I had a question about uh, the casting that you did for this film with the four friends. Yes. Because uh, um, I really liked the fact that you could see that uh, you sort of, sort of saw the hierarchy inside the friendship mm -hmm. right off the bat. And I was wondering how the audition process went um, when you found those four girls. Uh, yeah, thank you for asking that. It was kind of a wonderful process. I think the director was so um, caring and careful and thoughtful in assembling the four girls and for exactly what you're saying, mm -hmm. that there was a dynamic that was underneath all of it that 
was not just, oh, just four lovely actresses just coming together. Like, she really wanted the power struggle and the hierarchy and the pressure and the mm. popularity and all those aspects to come through and the neediness and the insecurity um, and the likability because, um, like, Halston Sage's character was sort of the bitchiest and and the most challenging, and yet I think she's still lovable in her own way. Um, we did a lot of um, mixing and matching and um, considering, sometimes we would consider one girl for two or three different roles. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, and, and then there were people like we wanted uh, Alicia Bow was somebody we were investigating who's on 13 Reasons Why, if you guys have seen that, for um, Cynthia Wu's character, and she wasn't available. So it's like we had all these people that some that we liked that weren't available, some that we liked that we thought of for different characters, or we'd read them for two characters. Um, so the process just evolved in this really nice, organic way, and I think it helped that Rai, the director, was so good with actors. You know, she really... When she'd meet with them, she would do work sessions. She wouldn't just have them read once and say, oh, thank you very much. Like, she would really work to bring the best out in them. And in her mind, I think she had in mind all those layers. And so when she was casting, she imagined that end product in her head. And then it was just sort of finding the right people that, that had all the range that she wanted. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm glad you... Yeah. felt that from it because I think it that was the challenge was they weren't one-dimensional characters and I think that's that's what makes it um, kind of brings compassion for all of them yeah because it's about sort of finding compassion and even for the people that are bullying like you see there's a reason um, yeah. and you understand it more yeah I really liked it <laughs> great thank you thank you <laughs> Hi, Hi. Um, I'm Melissa. Thank you so much for taking the time oh, to be here. Oh, you're welcome. I graduated a year ago. So cool. in a span of a year, I've met a couple of managers and agents. And I've been a reader in auditions as well. Mm -hmm. I also enjoy being on the other side. And I've heard so many misconceptions about make your own space or don't hold the hand or <laughs> head the headshot or don't bring the headshot because <laughs> say, you had to save money. So what are you do not in an audition <laughs> room and do. Oh, well, I would say don't shake hands just because <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's just, it's one of you, but it's, for us, it's like, you know, 40 people in a day and people, you know, especially during flu season, it's just, I think, <laughs> you know, it's germ warfare out there. What can we do? We have to protect ourselves and how much Purell can you really, you know, so, yeah. I mean, just with the best of intentions, I think it's great to just say, hey, and start, you know, come in and say hello, not, not be shaking yeah um and and then uh headshots i think it's always great to have it it's like an umbrella if you take it it won't rain if you don't have it someone will ask you for it and then you're like oh it's in the car and you feel like oh i should have brought it so it doesn't hurt to have it um i think there's so many um there's so many little things that um i think when you said you worked as a reader i think that's a wonderful i mean obviously that's what happened to me, but then I, then I turned Stay tail and I became a <laughs> casting director instead of an actor. But, I mean, I think don't be afraid of that. Like, it's so, isn't it informative when you're a yes. reader? You, if you can intern in a casting office and see the other side of it, you'll just be amazed at what the directors and producers say and reveal to you about the process. And it's the only chance you really have to hear exactly what people are thinking and why someone... Um, does or doesn't get the part. Sometimes there's such random reasons that have nothing to do with an incredible performance. I mean, you know, someone could remind, you know, a producer or a director of, of the guy or girl that jilted them in high school, and it's just, like, so subliminal that, you yeah. know, that someone's given an amazing performance or their ex-wife that asked for too much alimony or ex-husband, I mean, you're, that ran over their cat. I mean, you just don't know the... <laughs> It, it sometimes it's literally not personal, um, but but there are some obvious things. I think one of the biggest things that sabotages people is nervousness, and um, sometimes people will come in and and they're lovely people, but they're so, they're literally shaking, and that's something to learn how to conquer because 
you can't, uh, you know, as I said about the camera picking up the such the most subtle things, like when that comes through, you have to find a way to conquer that. Um, meditation, working out, relaxation tapes, whatever it is, because um, you have to have that inner calm because that nervousness can just, you know, sabotage a great audition. Um, so I think the other thing is as unique as you guys all are, casting directors are unique in their pet peeves. Like I remember one time someone brought in a headshot resume that was unstapled and I was like, what is that? Like, what am I supposed to, what if it gets separate? And they, and they said, well, the last casting director said, don't ever staple your head to that resume. I'm like, who would say that? Like, that's right. crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, so everybody has their own pet peeves. I think the more you can kind of, when you're, you know, just sort of learn what casting directors like and realize there's no one answer, just do what feels right for you and, and ask them along the way when you have an opportunity and then kind of gather from there what works for you. I think that's the best. Thank Would you. you say that um, maybe if they go in for audition and they don't say, I have to get that job, then I'm just going to act and yeah. make a great impression, then the yeah. nervousness takes away. Because everybody's true. like, oh, it's life on death, so they start. It's you know. true. It's like, um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to feel that this <laughs> is the last opportunity. You want to feel absolutely, that's a great piece yeah. of advice, that it's just another opportunity to share your craft and yourself. And um, sometimes years later, I remember I was dying to be the casting coordinator on Saturday Night Live before I, because I loved Saturday Night Live when I was in New York, and I thought, oh, I just would love to be on it. And I would have, they, they had already cast all the first seasons, right? This is the first season. And I thought, oh, I would have been casting all the little day players for the skits. And at the time, it was so important to me. And then years later, I thought, I should write them a thank you note for not hiring me because I came to LA and everything happened to me after that. And I was so obsessed with starting it live. And so yeah. any one job that you become obsessed with, you have no idea what's around the corner that you're meant to get later. Yeah. You think it's the only thing. So that's perfect advice. Yeah. Brian Cranston, I just saw him on TV in 60 Minutes where he said he came here, but it doesn't matter. But he was saying that when Malcolm in the Middle, yeah, you know, uh, they canceled after seven seasons, he was so upset. But mm -hmm. if it wasn't canceled, he wasn't going right. to get Breaking Bad. Yeah. So there's always one door closed, one open. Yeah. So well, thank you so thank much you. for coming here. Yeah.